Speaker for the night, Chris. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Maddox. Hi, Chris. Chris. Mm, prom night. <laughs> um, this this is incredible. Um, I never. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I never went to prom. Anybody in here not actually go to their prom? It's pretty cool. I'm pretty into this. So uh, thanks, thanks to the committee for putting this on. It's an awesome idea. And um, yeah, welcome to anybody new. Anybody that was afraid to say that uh, that they're new or coming back. You know, I hope that you hear something that keeps you fired up for your recovery. And um, this, this is such a beautiful thing we have here in Narcotics Anonymous. And I'm, I'm so grateful that um, I was one of the lucky ones that found the rooms, you know, because uh, we all know somebody who didn't, you know, who and, and who could have said to be here. And um, man, um, I get terribly nervous doing this kind of stuff. And uh, Leslie asked me probably back in July, and I've, I've had anxiety ever since. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty ready for, for 2019 to be over, pretty much. Um, it's, a, it's a total honor and a privilege to be of service to this program. And, um, and so, you know, I'm just going to tell my story. It is what it is. And, um, and there's, there's parts that I wish um, that I could change. And um, there's, and there's parts that I have tremendous gratitude for. And um, this year I've been um, just consumed with gratitude. And it started uh, when I went to the Nooner on um, Celebrate 11 Years on December 11th. And, um, yeah. and, and, um, I went like I do every year to the Nooner and, and, and got my, um, you know, got my key tag. I celebrate at my home group, but um, you know, that's just where it started for me was at the noon meeting. And, um, and uh, when I went in there, though, uh, man, I got uh, Shag. If you guys know Shag, he, he said, you know, um, congrats to Chris on 11 years. And when I heard somebody else say it, it was kind of like an animal seeing their reflection. It sunk in in a whole different way, man. And it just choked me up, man. But, um, you know, I, I didn't get here the easy way, uh, like many of you. Um, <laughs> uh, right. So for me, um, I feel weird because I've told my story a lot in this program. I don't have anything I like need to get off my chest. I've done H and I a bunch, man. I've done shut up and listen, and um, and a lot of I, I know a lot of you. But for those of you who, who I don't know, I haven't told my story to you know. Um, I hope that you hear something you can relate to. And, and what I heard when I first got here was look for the similarities, not the differences, because my story is my own. Nobody's gonna have it. Just like I'm not gonna have your story, but um, there'll be stuff you can relate to. And uh, so for me, man. Um, Addiction, addiction was a family disease. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't feel like I grew up in a dysfunctional home, but um, but my dad was never there, and I didn't really know why. You no, know? and I, um, my mom, she's a nurse, and she was just real clinical in the way she talked to me. She said, um, you know, he's sick, and I was like, okay. And um, I used to see these alcoholic commercials on TV for this rehab in my area, and. Um, and they said that's, you know, um, my mom and, and my grandma, they said, that, you know, he, he was an alcoholic. And I didn't understand quite what that meant, but um, I knew there was some treatment for that. And so um, I'll never forget uh, the first time I ever got asked what I wanted to be when I grow up. I said, I don't care. I just want a good job so I could send my dad uh, to this particular arena. Oh, anyway. Um, so I was a happy kid, though. I didn't have any issues. I wasn't a biter or a hitter or anything like that, um, like one of my kids. Um, I'm going to say about that from Mama's side. Um, yeah, I, I deflect with humor. That's um, good. Anyway, um, so, you know, I always had this dream that, that you know, I'd have a family. and. Um, and one day, uh, my mom called me inside, and she said, you know, she she um, had my dad on the phone, said he want she he wanted to talk to me. I was like, awesome, you know. And um, I hadn't talked to him in a while. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And um, he said he was in rehab. They called it rehab back then. It's treatment now, right? And um, <laughs> and uh, and he said he was coming home, and we're going to be a family again. And that was like my wish come true, and I couldn't believe it. I was so grateful. And um, 
And I left that day, um, you know, went hit hit the uh, you know the block that I play on, and um, spring by step, just totally pumped up, full of hope. And um, and then some time went by, and you know, my time scale isn't good as a child. Um, but uh, I got called back in, and um, and I wasn't sure why streetlights hadn't come on. That was my childhood single mom, you know, in front of the TV. Um, streetlights come on, it's time to come home. And um, wasn't sure why, and she called me in, and she told me that um, my dad had passed from an overdose. And uh, um, it was the day before the Fourth of July, so I never forget the date. And um, and um, I argued. I said, you know, I was like, no, that's that's not right. He's in rehab, and um, and um, but I could tell, you know, that that it was real, and um, and uh, yeah. So I I hit I hit the block again, pretty pretty angry, right? Um, where I grew up, I wasn't I wasn't able to show um, sadness, sorrow like I do now, right? Um, and I'm still getting used to that, but um, <laughs> you know, I I could show it a safe way through anger. Right, that's what I was allowed to show humor and anger, and that's it. And um, I was an angry kid, and um, and uh, I made sure that um, that I wasn't letting my addiction get out of hand, right, by regulating. And uh, I don't know if any of you tried moderation, but um, that didn't work out so well, right? Um, but my mom was real clinical. She said, you know, be careful. You have this genetic predisposition. It's in our family, you know, and um, you could suffer from that. And so. I thought, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going, I'm gonna moderate, right? And at the time, commercials used to say, "Know when to say when." Do you guys remember that? <laughs> right? right. Except for after two, like the first effects of alcohol is a lack of inhibition. So when I'm, I'm saying, "Fuck when," right? <laughs> and um, anyway, I made sure that I always kept somebody with me who was a little bit more bad off than I was, so I could be like, "Well, I'm not, I'm not doing it like this," right? <laughs> you know. Um, you know, or they were they were doing certain drugs that I wasn't doing yet, um, but I always end up, you know, you do what you're in the company of the people that you keep. And so I always had that person, and that person seemed to keep getting worse off somehow, and um, and changing and different. And then and then one day I think I became that somebody for somebody, right? And um, I was doing all those things that they said they never do um, until they became that. But um, so I became uh, I was in and out of county jails, you know, I'm not like a prison guy or anything like that, but I, I sampled county jails all over the country, and um, ge- geographical relocation was a big was a big strategy for me, because um, I didn't know how to not blame others for my misery, right? It was everybody else's fault, it was the city's fault, it was the government, it was the cops, it was all kinds of other stuff except for myself. I didn't know a thing about personal accountability, right? And so I just kept... Um, I kept moving, right? I was embarrassed to be homeless in my hometown, so I just took I just took that on the road, and, and um, I became um, I was you've seen them here and in this neighborhood, you know, and um, down the way, um, you know, just one of those homeless dudes with a dog riding freight trains, man. And I spent um, a lot of years out there doing that. I was just alone, um, or you know, with other people like that, riding um, pretty angry, super violent, down for whatever and any kind of dope. And um, and just kind of like isolating from from any kind of responsibility or any kind of like real uh, contribution to society. Wasn't holding jobs, just panhandling, um, hustling. And when I say hustling, like nothing fancy. Like I was never balling. Like I'd ru- I'd run some errands for like a dude who was running errands for a baller. But um, right, I'm not trying to come with ego here. Like crumb snatcher shit for real. And. Um, <laughs> And um, anyway, um, so I, I had passed through Oregon actually several times, and I always thought it was really beautiful here. And um, and I dreamed that I'd live here someday. And um, but you know, I, none of my dreams were coming true. I talk about all kinds of hopes and stuff that I thought would be would be nice, but I was always looking for that other place. I was always looking for happiness somewhere else. I was gonna find the right town, the right girlfriend, the right whatever combination, um, as long as it was something external that involved me not changing whatsoever, right? Because I could not handle that I had unresolved grief and loss, that I was the problem, that I was an addict, um, that I had anger issues, uh, any of that. And so um, I never never did find that town, um, but I did 
uh, end up here in Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> people, were, people were like, when did you move here? And I was like, well, I, I, I kind of the party skidded to a halt here. <laughs> um, but, uh, and actually, um, I, got, I got pretty lucky, I guess. Um, I, met, I met a lady, and she was whatever, dated homeless guys, and, um, <laughs> I didn't see anything wrong with it at the time, you know, but, uh, anyway, um, so I moved right in, you know, and, um, and, and my dog, too, and, um, you know, um, we, we started, we were, um, we were living together, and there was there was good times, you know. And I was in love, and I cared about her, and it wasn't all bad, you know. But um, we we're definitely toxic, super sick, and nothing to build on. And um, you know, um, one day, um, well, I started working, and so I thought I had finally found my winning combination of like getting high, dabbling, drinking, and um, working on a fire crew, which would like keep me busy in the summertime, but. Um, you know, leave me at the end of the summer with a pocket full of money and like zero goals. Like my goal was to drink the top shelf at the Cottage Grove liquor store, right? Because I mean, I had, I had no, I didn't know what to do with money, right? I never had money, and um, just ridiculous shit like that. And so, um, anyways, I wasn't allowed to get high when her kid was there, and um, but I made some kind of exception or something, and she was putting him to bed, and I. Um, she came downstairs and I was uh, I was blue I was I was OD and, and I was in the living room and that dog I had with me he was laying on my chest and she knew um, something was wrong and um, I'm still not super good at, at making women happy but I know what doesn't work and that was uh, that one caused a lot of a lot of issues in the relationship and um, so I was in the hospital for a little bit and um, she was super pissed. Um, she did the rest of my dope while I was out, because um, uh, so, right, that's logical. Um, right, and, uh, anyway, um, we, were, we weren't going to do it anymore, right? And I had to clean up. Okay, so, so I decided, all right, I'm getting clean. And um, I did for a little bit, um, you know, and I was like all the love and all the willpower and strength and gumption and determination. And, and I made it about two weeks. Right, like totally isolating, not hanging out with anybody, not leaving the house really. Made it, made it two weeks, right? But just like white knuckling it, and uh, somehow made some kind of exception. I think it was my birthday or something. I decided to drink, and then, and then it was just you know, I would, we go. It was just on again after that, and um, that's when I was starting to realize like I, I can't really stop. Um, and I mean, I don't know why I had issues with accepting that because I'd already been through Buckley House like several times, and um, you know, and. Um, and uh, for anybody who knows me now, like I, I do like to share that um, at Buckley House, like, um, I like to get honest, but it's also kind of funny, is um, when I was there, I was so impressed with how nice the socks were that I stole them. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and because they were nice and thick and they had the skitties on the bottom, right? And I had, the socks I was wearing were, were gross, right? They were funky and, um, and never nice, never, never anything above the, the um, the super thin like canes, plain socks, right? So anyways, not only did I steal the socks, I was super proud of this, and I um, went home and showed my girl, and she was the kind of lady who was impressed with my heist of stealing the socks. <laughs> so she was like, hell yeah, babe. <laughs> like I brought home the bacon. <laughs> I'm out there coming up. <laughs> The insanity, man, to like not even see like any issue with it. Like that was just life. That was normal business, you know. And um, anyway, <clears throat> um, yeah. So I got back to using, and then um, in no time later, um, you know, there I was, OD'd again in some trap house um, downtown Eugene, and um, paramedics had a hard time getting me back, and um, there was a bunch of other bullshit that went along with it, and I was um, I was pretty shook up from it. And you know, some of the other times I blamed it on it was an accident or I was this or I was that. And um, I, there I was making the same mistake my dad made, right? And so there was the whole like, you know, education piece of addiction, right? We all know that shit kills us, right? 
but everybody thinks it's not going to be me, or then we get to a point where we don't care if it's me. Um, but I knew something had to be different, and I didn't know how to I didn't know how to do that. And um, I went uh, down to California, created a bunch more wreckage down there, and then um, long story short, I uh, I just kind of surrendered, and I and I prayed that that I get something different, and. Um, and I was buying my last adult beverage at a store on Willamette Street, and um, I ran into a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in about four years. And uh, she she was very clean cut, looked like a college student. And when she said, hey, Chris, I figured she was talking to somebody else because I didn't know anybody that looked like that, right? And um, But I looked, and it was a, an old friend of mine who I had talked to because she didn't talk to users anymore. Um, she was going to the University of Oregon, and I hadn't seen her since I was in Portland, Maine, right, on the east of the other Portland, for those not good geography. Um, so like 3,000 miles away was the last time I saw this person. She's in the program. She comes to this town randomly. I come to this town randomly, and there we are. By my, I'm there, like, kind of trying to surrender. And um, she said, how are you? How are you doing? And um, normally, you know, we do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm good. And I was like, I'm, I'm bad. I'm doing bad. And... Um, she got my number, and um, and I prayed after that. And I was a card-carrying atheist, right? But you know, I'd still do that emergency prayer. And um, I had been to meetings um, back in my hometown, but I I guess I like lost the idea. Like I didn't remember how you can just walk back in or whatever. I didn't know. I thought maybe I would check in with somebody first or something. And um, I prayed that she asked me to go to a meeting, and she called me the next day. I told her I had one day clean, and she asked me to go to a meeting. And um, and and on the phone, I can still remember. I was like, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, man. And I was like, um, yeah, I guess. Can't ever be a higher thinking out there, right? And um, anyway, so the next day, um, we meet up and and uh, we walk down from from her house um, over to the Luther house to the noon NA meeting, and. Um, I, I still remember it was rainy. I was not super excited to be walking in the rain. I wasn't super excited to be walking into a meeting. I didn't like the fact that I was going someplace I didn't know for reasons that I wasn't that into. Like, if we were going to get a bag, I'd be like, no complaints the whole way, right? But I didn't know what I was walking into. Not knowing what I'm walking into made me feel really good, right? And um, anybody who was uh, going to the Luther house back then remembers you couldn't wear your shoes in there, right? They had a carpet. and. Um, I was definitely the kind of guy, if you had over and you wanted people to take their shoes off, you would just leave it a shoe, leave my shoes on. <laughs> not bathing regularly, um, not doing so well. And, um, and the secretary wanted to give me a hug before the meeting started. And that was, that was super awkward. And um, I don't remember if I did it. But then when it came time for key tags, uh, I would not get up for the key tag. And he looked right at me. And I started getting that like, why, why are you looking at me, bro, kind of thing. But, and um, so whenever I do key tags, I never look at the newcomer. If they want to get up and get one, cool. But um, I was really like, man, don't, I don't want anybody to know I'm new. I was terrified that I didn't know what I was doing. I know the game all day, right? And it doesn't change, right? And I was comfortable with that. Um, I didn't know recovery and that, again, that was terrifying. And um, I did walk up to him after the meeting. I was like, let me get one of those key tags. And I was super, I was super excited to have it on my keychain and everything. You know? and, um, and and then again, I talk about Shaq a couple times because he's in my sponsorship tree and he's uh, really influenced me a lot. And um, you know, he he um, I met him in the parking lot that same day after the meeting. Told him a little bit about what was going on, and he's like, well, you know what, your your story is going to help somebody. And then I kind of lost respect for him because I was like, my story is absolute mess. <laughs> like, how am I going to ever help somebody with this? And, um, but I kept going back. And I never I never had the pink cloud. I was never that excited. Um, I wasn't like pumped to be a Narcotics Anonymous. I wasn't about to come to a dance. Um, anybody who's been clean longer than me knows, like, I wasn't much of a talker in the beginning either. I didn't share at all. Um, I didn't share till I had about four months, and that was only because my friend had a birthday. Um, I talked with somebody after the meeting, maybe a little bit, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't very social. Definitely wasn't coming to dances, and um, that took a long time um, to become, to feel whole and human again. And um, I kept having issues, and I kept hearing the same, the same answer, and that was, well, why don't you work the steps? 
I didn't know how that was going to help for like, you know, I become, I become full of hate in really terrible ways. Um, and and I, it was my truth, but I, I felt toxic from it. So I knew something wasn't right about it. And um, that slowly started going away. And that was, that was relieving. It's exhausting to carry around hate. And it's like, it's just unnecessary baggage. And um, it took me a long time to really um, assimilate into normal life. I thought I couldn't hold a regular job. I did some, I did some firefighting. I did working in the woods for a while. But I never felt like I can get like regular life. You know, I'd go to the grocery store and get like half of what's on the list and just be like, man, I gotta, I gotta bail out of here, man. Like, you know, um, I feel like, you know, people like put their cart too close to me. And I'm like, where well, I grew up is just super hostile. You don't bump into people. You don't touch their shoes. You don't like whatever. And um, and uh, so I was like, I was getting these like social violations all the time, maybe organized different rules or something. And I'm just like, this is the part where we slow down, you know. And I'm in Weimar though, and uh, I'm like, I just, I just knew, man. I like, man. Um, I just heard like, let, let that stuff go, let it go, man. And um, and uh, I'll never forget. Um, any of the old timers remember Henry P. He had been living somewhere in um, Hawaii or something like that, and he came back there. And I was like, oh, this guy's back. And he's the kind of guy who'd tell you to shut the F up in a meeting if you were, like, talking um, when something was going on. Real, like, um, you know, uh, just a real rugged old-timer dude, right? Old school, right? And um, he'd tell you how it is. And, um, and I appreciated that. I can relate to that kind of stuff. And um, one day I remember, um, so I had, I had some recovery relationships, and... Um, I, I somehow got drugged to, drugged to the holiday market, you know, that they have over at the fairgrounds. <laughs> and that's like, for me, I was just like on the verge of panic attack the whole time in there, right? And there's just people just bumping into me and, host, you know, I was just like, I don't think I can do life, man. Like, I just like really attached. I'm like, I just need to throw in the towel, right? It's like, um, it's just too intense. And um, I had three years clean at the time. and. Um, I pulled out my coin and I just started using it like a like a worry stone. And from around the corner, it was like I summoned a genie. Henry P comes walking around and he's got this big old smile like he just doesn't give a shit at all. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and um, he was excited to see me and he gave me a big old hug and it was a relief and it reminded me that like, yeah, I don't know what he'd been through, but like he's doing fine in here. I could probably do fine in here okay too. And um, just that re-socialization of being here, that took a long time, man, long time, you know. But um, I kept working those steps, and I got roped into service with some people. My sponsor was good about just, he had me come over to his house one day, and then I was like the uh, secretary for Unity Day <laughs> somehow after that. And I was like, okay, um, service wasn't something I volunteered for. I never heard about service work when I was a kid or volunteering like that was I don't know who that was for but not for me and um, having t extra time for, for stuff or others right and um, so I, I learned how to be a service in Narcotics Anonymous and that's been um, that's been just such a tremendous part of my life lately and and um, you know I've, I've found that service doesn't always have to come in holding a service position and service that that mindset of being of service comes in so many different ways. It's something we carry with us. We don't have to turn off just because like we're done with the service committee meeting or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I, I started having this relationship with a sponsor and it was the first healthy relationship I ever had in my life, right? Where I just didn't hold back and I got honest with somebody and I didn't realize it, but he had been telling me his stuff this whole time, but I was there for me and only thinking about me. And I never realized like every time I'd give him something, he was giving me something back. You know, telling me about, oh yeah, this time he did that or whatever, and um, and that was an incredible relationship to have. And um, you know, one day um, life got real difficult in recovery, and and I was under that understanding like that was going to happen to other people, but not to me because I'm working steps, right? <laughs> and um, that's just not how it goes, right? And so um, I was in a relationship, and I got dumped, right? And I like to. I could just say like uh, the relationship ended um, and kind of put it gentle or like it wasn't, you know, but no, I got, she dropped the axe on me, right? And I wasn't ready for it. It's like, okay. And then um, that dog that I said I had with me in my addiction, you know, and then was on my chest, 
Um, he was only uh, two months shy of eight when um, he when he passed from cancer, and um, th that one shook me up. And that was one of my reservations. That one I didn't think I could stay clean for. And I had three years clean, but I did it. And that was a mess. I held it together in public, but then I get back to my truck, and it was like, it was a little bit emotional. <laughs> the truck was my little safe space for a while there. Um, but, so the relationship ended, I had to move, the dog died, and then when I was moving, my truck broke down, and I was like, I had to laugh. I was like, my life is a shitty country song. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally, man, the truck, the dog, the girl, the house, you know, it, all, it all went away, man. And, um, and then the IRS decided to sue me, said I didn't claim something. And, um, and I said I couldn't handle one more thing. I cannot handle one more thing. And that's when my sponsor at the time called me and told me, um, my sponsee brother had OD, Ivan. If you guys remember Ivan P. Anybody? And um, he was a very likable man. And um, to have your sponsor call you at midnight crying, not knowing what to do, looking heavy day. And, and um, that was my one more thing. But the thing is, I didn't get low rage, right? I didn't get high, right? And I knew what to do. And I've been coming. Life had gotten really good. And see, I've seen a lot of people life gets really good for it, and they quit coming, right? So a lot of people in here I know with beautiful lives, and they're still coming. That's how you're going to hold on to it. Because the shit's always going to come. The shit's always going to come. And I must have heard that somewhere early on in recovery. Because when life got really nice, I kept coming. I kept doing my routine meetings. I heard get a home group. I religiously went to my home group. During the duck game, because it's on a Saturday, whatever. <laughs> like. Anytime I've tried to ditch out on my home group for the duck game, they, they lose. So <laughs> I was like, I have an earbud in maybe. And <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not skipping home group for the duck game. Um, but um, So I kept coming on the good days, man. And that's the only way I made it through it. Because I already had people there who knew me. I already had conscious contact with a higher power. Already had support network. Already had the sponsor. And already had meetings that I felt comfortable at going to, no matter how I felt or what I looked like or what I was going through. And that's what saved my ass, man. And um, so, you know, life got different again. And um, I've been going to school at this time. And uh, school, I mean, school, that's a trip, right? But like I said, uh, I never went to prom. I never graduated high school. That was always something I felt sort of weird about. And, um, you know, I was a high school dropout. And um, college, that was kind of for other people. But when I got clean, it was during the recession, 2008. I remember meetings in 2008. Half of it was about I'm trying to stay clean. The other half was people with time talking about they don't have a job, right? Or they got laid off, and um, it was pretty intense. So I decided I'll go to school and try and be a little bit more employable, or at least uh, get some financial aid that I'll probably never go and pay back, and um, <laughs> go to school. Beats working, and um, that was a bad plan, by the way. Student loan debt's real. Um, you know, we get a lot of bad financial advice in recovery. Yeah, just take out student loans. Right. Right. You know, you're clean, and you're like signing papers for like 50k in debt. <laughs> like, uh, just look into that. Um, <laughs> I want to get a second opinion. Man. But um, so I started going to school, man, and I actually started doing really good. And um, you know, they say lost dreams reawaken here. And um, I got my, I got some of my innocence back. I got my like interests back. And um, I said, you know what? Fuck it, man. I'm gonna be a scientist, man. Fuck it, man. I'm gonna be a scientist. Right? That sounds crazy, right? Um, but you know what? I went and did that. I went and did that shit, man. And um, I graduated from the university here. And then um, I applied to a bunch of graduate programs and um, got rejected by some big name schools. That's okay, because I was aiming high. And um, I'd actually done some research at the university here, and one of my advisors, he said he would take me on as a student, as, in a, as a doctoral student. So there I am, I get accepted into a doctoral program at a real university, and, um, and man, the imposter syndrome was real, man. I was like, I do not belong here, right? And there I am. Um, 
teaching classes at a university, assisting, but they give me one class a week, you know, where I'm just me and university students, and I'm doing their grades and shit. And I'm like, <laughs> like, do they know who they are? And, um, <laughs> but it was really cool. And so um, as, a, as a piece of that, though, um, some real cool opportunities opened up. Uh, I was invited to go do research in the Amazon down in Ecuador, right? And um, so I naturally I accepted, and right before I accepted, um, I found out um, that I was I was fathering a child, right? And um, I guess it wasn't a surprise because right you do you do certain things you get certain results, right? <laughs> uh, I, people, always, like, people always act like they were surprised. I'm like they, that's like that's the way it happens <laughs> since the dawn of time. Uh, and the surprise game was at the sec second ultrasound when they said it was twins. And I was like, oh shit, man. Like, I was happy, I was pumped to be a dad. But, like, I was like, man, that's somatic shit. I'm going from none, I'm like, I don't know what two's like. <laughs> um, and so, uh, right, go big, right? <laughs> I didn't even try this, I'm trying to. Okay. Um, and so, I go to Ecuador, Annika. Um, was pregnant um, with the twins, and um, there I am. I'm in the jungle doing science and shit, right? And um, and and I'm still like I'm an addict, right? I'm with all these scientists. They drink a whole lot. I can get loaded down there. The natives have their beverage that they make, and there's some other like stuff. And um, and and as a dope fiend who's been high in almost every North American city, I can cop anywhere, right? I, I've scored everywhere, and I know how to get it. And so. Um, I wasn't like, hey, I'm just in the jungle, no big deal. I was like, no, I gotta be on point with my recovery, like every bit. And so there I am in the jungle, in a tent, um, working my 10 step out of the Living the Program IP, like my sponsor suggested, right? And so I was like, man, um, every couple weeks I'm going back into town, it's this small town uh, that I'm staying in, and it's a, maybe about the size of Cottage Grove. I'm like, I don't know how I can I don't know how I can handle this anymore. Like this is just getting rugged. Like I need my program, I need my people. And um, right then a taxi drives by and on the back of this taxi in Spanish it says solo por hoy, which means just for today, with the big NA circle with the diamond in it, man. In the fucking Ecuador, man, in a small town. And I was like, Oh hell. and then I ended up meeting that taxi driver later and um and I spoke some terrible Spanish with them. <laughs> and, um, and I was able to go to a meeting down there. And that was super cool, man. And um, you know, what I love about this is it's a worldwide fellowship. We don't care who you are, man. You know, only what you want to do about your problem and how you can help. And so, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not fearless, but I'll go anywhere for a bag. I'll go anywhere for a meeting. And so um, I went and found this meeting on the maps whatever, and um, I walked through some neighborhoods that maybe I shouldn't have, and I'm in Quito, Ecuador. It's, it can be rugged in some places, and um, I'm looking for this meeting, and I'm like, I don't know where it's at. I can't tell, and um, the addresses aren't super crisp like they are here, and um, there it is. Uh, coming up, I see three dudes in hoodies smoking cigarettes, <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> This has got to be the spot. <laughs> like, and it was like a noon meeting, maybe a, a 12.30 meeting or whatever, something like that, midday. And um, they were cool, man. And it wasn't like some AA building or whatever. It was an NA building. And they had the NA steps and traditions up on the wall. And for anybody who doesn't know, that's cool if you work all kinds of programs. I work one program with one sponsor, man. I love Narcotics Anonymous. We have phenomenal literature here. Um, the literature speaks to me. Right? And so... Um, the thing is, when I got to this place, man, these guys welcomed me. They gave me coffee, and um, and what I didn't know is they have you share by the order that you come into the meeting, right? <laughs> and um, so they called on me, and I was like, I can speak some Spanish, but they were like, I was like, hey, man, my Spanish sucks, and and it, like like that, they're all in English, and I was like. Mm -hmm. and I, hadn't been, I hadn't been to a meeting in two months, man. And uh, if you've seen anybody who works a pretty serious program who hasn't been to a meeting in a long time, they'll just dump some stuff on the meeting, maybe. 
like, yeah. you know when so you're like, man, they haven't been to a meeting in a while. <laughs> it was that, like two months of that, right? And, um, and yeah, I was like, I was in the jungle, man, and there's bugs, and I was like, all these scientists drinking, and they're all just laughing. Uh, and they knew, and it was, the, it was the same exact shit we have here, man, and that was so beautiful, you know? And um, I've gotten to go to meetings in other states, and um, and just visit with addicts all over the place, you know, doing wholesome stuff. And uh, wholesome stuff isn't something I realized I was down to be a part of. I thought that was for other people, right? And um, like I came here, I was like, whatever. I'm just, you know, I'm quick getting high. I figure some things out. Like my man Billy in the corner says, figuring it out ain't one of the steps. Right? <laughs> so I just stayed clean for a while, and I kept hearing, do the next right thing. And I wasn't committed to being like the next right person or like an honorable person. I was just like, I probably just do this next right thing. And I did that long enough. And, um, but my plan would still be a total outlaw, make my own rules, like fuck the government, fuck cops, all this and that, and, um, and not abide by any of society's rules, man. And, um, so uh, my best friend over there, Jeremiah, he gets me to do all the fun stuff that I do, right? You gotta have a tight ring, man. And, um, for me, it's natural to just be like, no, it's cool, I'm gonna go home, right? <laughs> Good, I'm going home, right? After I'm done here, I'm going home, right? Um, but he said, we're going to run a race, right? <laughs> I'm like, you, we don't run, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I said, oh, okay, and so, um, we had a lot less responsibilities back then, and I didn't have any kids, so I, I was like, all right, we'll run this race, okay? And um, we start training, and it's the Butte to Butte, right? And it's uh, it goes from Spencer Butte to Skinner Butte, right through Eugene, right? And um, the first mile is uphill. It's a huge event, if you haven't seen it, it's on 4th of July, and um, we do it, right? And uh, they have professional photographers, and one of the photographers took a picture when we get to the top of the hill, and I'm like, we're just like, oh, you know, you can tell we're like work, like working hard at this, and uh, there's an elderly lady in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> we're struggling, man. And you know, I was probably 34 back then, so it's not, you know, I, I probably was, you know, should have been in better shape, right? But um, I wasn't one of those dudes who's like, I'm clean now, I'm going to the gym. <laughs> I always envy yeah. those, those dudes. I just have, I'm not there yet, maybe, maybe next year. Um, but uh, anyway, what happened was we start running this race and we're midway through and the cops are doing crowd control and they looked at me and Jeremiah and they said, good job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, and I felt something there. I know he did too. I want to talk about how emotional we both got, uh, not right at that moment, but um, that was the day I realized something had changed. Like, I wasn't just some outlaw dude trying to stay clean. Like I was an actual good person and citizen of the community, <laughs> and the cops well, were okay with me. And I was like, this is like, what's happening? And um, that was that was pretty intense. That was a really intense realization uh, to have, you know. And so um, Jeremiah's got me to do a lot of things, actually. Um, everybody in recovery does these campouts. Ever since I've been clean, people are talking about camp recovery, right? Camp recovery, Woo! camp recovery. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. I was like, fuck camp, and I did enough of that when I was homeless. <laughs> <laughs> uh-uh. Yeah, not camping, right? Yeah. Listening to everybody else's music. <laughs> Good on that. Um, but you know what? Um, I went because all, all the good people in my support network were going. And I was like, all right, I'll check it out. And I rode my bike down to uh, down to the uh, Rogue River Raft out, down on the Rogue River, Woo! outside of Rams Pass, Oregon. If you've never been, you gotta check it out. Couple, couple hundred dope fiends on energy drinks, staying clean, <laughs> on white water rafts. Nobody fighting. Maybe a little bit of yelling at the kids, but nobody's doing, everything's solid, man. A whole campground, man. Beautiful people from all over the West Coast just hanging out, man. And um, you know, riding motorcycles has been something that I've found to be um, a really important part of my recovery. You know, for all of us, we find those passions. That was not something I had time for. When I was still using, I had things like, 
I'm like, oh, we should, we should get a boat, man. And, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know those conversations we were having out there, right, that yeah. never come true? I quit talking at the end of my addiction because people would talk about, oh, we should, we should. And we were never gonna, man. We were in and out of jail. And we were dope sick, man. We didn't have shit. The people I was running with. And um, I'm not trying to glorify like I was some extra low bottom addict. I'm just saying like we weren't <coughs> living to our full potential, and none of those dreams were coming true. And I quit talking about them for years. And um, but anyways, I was like, man, I'm getting a bike, and um, that was really cool, man. That's that turned into a, a big part of my my recovery, man. I got into a motorcycle club, and riding, and um, doing runs, and um, and just hanging out with, with tons of people, you know, that solid brotherhood, expanding my support network, you know, and, and having something, just having something to do with my free time, right? I didn't know what to do with my free time. And um, I do want to share about overcoming one thing because uh, we went on a run one time and um, I was in the back doing uh, road guard, which is, um, I mean rear guard, sorry, where you come up and you make sure if anybody's broke down, you take care of them. And, um, and we come up around the corner and there was a wreck man, and uh, there was already people off their bikes and um, and it looked bad. I figured some broken legs or something like that. And uh, it was a member of our community, Scott Harris. And I'm saying his last name because he died that day. Man. And, um, and that was a really intense thing, you know, to watch a man taking his last breaths. You know, um, he lived... Um, and died doing what he loved, and, that's, and so that's how I, I reconciled with that. But it's it's an awkward feeling to to be clean and to be able to show up to work after that uh, that next Monday, and people are like, "How's your weekend?" Right? I'm like, nobody's nobody really cares how your weekend was. They're not ready for that shit, man. And um, I don't ever ask anybody how their weekend was unless I'm ready to fucking hear about their weekend. When I walk past people, and that's what I learned from my Latin American people, man, I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Because if I don't t have time to listen to, if I say, how are you doing? I've got time to listen to that, right? Otherwise, I'm just walking by saying good morning, right? Um, that shit's intense. But anybody who's been in these rooms, man, knows we're going to lose somebody, man. We're going to lose people here, right? And we're going to lose them out there, right? We had a big tragedy last year um, when we lost Angie. I know a lot of people still suffering from that. Um, the thing is, like, we don't have to use no matter what. And in fact, there's no worse way that I could think of to honor somebody I care about than to use over their death. That's fucking bullshit, man. And that's what I did every time. I was so ready for it. And I was losing people. I'm like, oh, I've got to get loaded or whatever. And um, that's garbage. That's a garbage way to deal with it. I mean, I don't blame anybody if that's all they've got, you know. But um, we've, we've got so many tools and so much support here. I've literally seen people stay clean through every single thing life can throw in here, man. And that's promising. I heard a guy at Shut Up and Listen, my third meeting, share about staying clean through the loss of a child. And I was like, I didn't have kids at the time, but I knew the gravity of that situation. And I thought, man, if that dude can stay clean through that, then I can stay clean through any garbage my little life's got going on, man. And um, that gave me hope. That gave me hope. Because I wasn't going to sign on for this if I thought I was going to have to throw it away every four months when somebody I knew died. Right, because I was losing people all the time. I'm not throwing away my recovery <coughs> because of feelings today. Feelings aren't the greatest, man, but I'm wearing them. Um, so, um, what I do know is that Narcotics Anonymous has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah, that's a true statement. Yes. A little PTSD in here. <laughs> Just anyway, oh. <laughs> trying to slice it up. Okay, I get it. Man. That's the five-minute one. Oh, uh, man. Um, so I just recently had my third child born. Uh, just to let people know, I I made him at camp recovery. Right. And, um, <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're not acting perfect in your recovery, that's fine. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do embarrassing things here. Just try and stay clean. Uh, you might make a baby tonight. It's going to happen. <laughs> uh, if I wrecked it for some of you, then good. <laughs> but, um, anyways.
Um, I can't wait to see everybody dancing and having a great time. This is such a beautiful thing we have here in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm grossly overpaid. I'm going to keep coming back and see what else happens. I love you all. Let's uh, leave all our bullshit in 2019 and start off 2020 fresh. Yes.